worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, He holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in His place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. The God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accept it, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord be praised. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Symphony in my ears It's like holy 
It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. For I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water, your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water it's like holy water on my skin It's like holy water Thank you, Father God, for your forgiveness Promise. 
shield You've been my defender On the battlefield Oh, you've been my father You've been my rock You've been my portion And you're more than enough Oh, you've been my shelter You've been my strength You've been my provider Again and again Oh, you've been my redeemer And I can't comprehend How the God of creation Would call me His friend What a friend I found in you Jesus What a friend I found in you When no one else could keep us Is all 
all you are, will you meet me here again? As I walk now through the valley, Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are, will you meet me here again? I'm not enough, unless you come. Is all you are Will you meet me here again? Forsaken, the Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive those awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken.
You know, I want to start by saying that this message today, it has the potential to impact your life much more than probably any message I've given you in quite a while. And at the same time, it'll be the easiest one for you to shake off and pretend it's for someone else sitting around you. Be forewarned, this message today is for all of us. It's for every single one of us. Now, last week, what did we learn? We learned that we all tell lies. We all lie. As much as we want to think we're the most honest people in the world, we all lie. And we discover that the person that we lie to the most is who? Ourselves. We lie to ourselves the most. And so I want to start out with a question for you this morning. What do you think the biggest lie we tell ourselves is? More is better. That's the biggest lie that we tell ourselves. More is better. 
And it reflects the very first lie that was ever spoken in the garden. When the serpent told Adam and Eve something very interesting. Now, if you remember, in the Genesis account, Adam and Eve are enjoying perfect community with God and with his creation. It says that they were naked and in love and they weren't ashamed. They were in this perfect environment and God told them, he says, you can eat from the fruit of any tree except this one. You can't partake of this one. But here enters the serpent and what does the serpent do? He poses a question. Did God really say, right? And what was the message? The message was really clear. That what you don't have is what you need in order to be happy and fulfilled. What God had given them. He had given them all the, all the fruits and, uh, of all the trees in the garden except for one. And Satan says, because you don't have that one, you can't be happy. And from that point in time, more has always been thought of as better. i got to have more. Well, pastor, I'm not like that. I don't have that mindset. Oh, yeah, we all do. What's the number one thing people say? Oh, I need more money. If I just had more money, oh, if I just had more in my bank account, if I just had more wealth, oh, my gosh. If I just had that that new gadget, that new phone, that new toy. Oh my gosh. I would, my life. I, oh, if I just had that new pair of shoes or that purse or that watch or more muscles, you know, bigger is better, more square footage in my house. Oh, the house I live in is not good enough. If I just traveled more, if I had more likes, more followers, if I had more hair, right? I mean, you know, there's a list goes on. More of everything. We want more all the time. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. What if the stuff you have is keeping you from the life that you want? What if your stuff is keeping you from the life that you really want? We're in a series called The Need to Simplify. Today's title is When Less is the Best. Let's pray. Lord, um, wow, this message... It's a tough one, God. And Lord, if we're going to simplify our lives, then we need to do the things to simplify it. And I pray today that we would truly have eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, we wouldn't look around the room and think this is for everybody else. No, it's for me. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, God, to take what you have for us today. Let it absorb our very being, the essence of who you are. May it penetrate our hearts and our minds. And may we walk out of here and make a decision to truly change. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said. So I want to introduce to you the key thought this morning. It actually comes from a story in Acts chapter 27. Now Paul is on a ship and he's on his way to Rome. As he's on his way to Rome, they encounter this, this great storm. And this storm is just beating them down. And the storm is so bad to the point that they actually, the sailors and the crew, they think they're going to die. Now, if you're a sailor, right, storms are part of your job. You learn how to weather them. And you know when a storm is so bad that you think, man, I may not get out of this. And so Acts 27 tells us that after two weeks without eating, what was Paul doing? He was fasting and praying. It says without, with a, uh, for two weeks that he does this, that, that at the end of this two-week period, Paul takes bread, he breaks it, and he gives thanks, and he eats some bread. We pick up our story in Acts 27, verse 36. It says, then they were all encouraged seeing Paul do this. Why? Because they knew that Paul was a man of God. And it says, and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. Quite quite a few people. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. 
So it says that Paul, he partook of the bread, gave thanks. When they saw Paul do this, they were encouraged. They ate food for themselves. And it says, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. In other words, they threw out what they did not need. Well, why? Why did they do this? Why did they lighten the ship? Because less was better. By lightening the ship, the ship could get faster. It would maneuver better. It could maybe outrun the the storm, and it'd be easier to maneuver and, and avoid rocks. When did they lighten the ship? When they had enough. What is enough? When you have what you need. Last week, we talked about behaviors and the fact that behaviors begin in our heart. And when they're in our heart, then they become habits. And so to practice a habit of simplifying, you need to have an I have enough attitude. Say, I have enough. enough. Problem is you don't believe you have enough. That's the problem. One of the most famous psalms is Psalm 23. I do a lot of funerals, and it's one of the most asked-for psalms for me to recite from. In that psalm, it says something. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, what, want. In other words, the Lord is my shepherd, I have enough. This is what David is saying. And we need to get ourselves in the mindset of Psalm 23. We need to get ourselves into this mindset. And so today what I want to do is I want to share a very short, small little prayer that you can begin to be, you can begin praying it today and pray it every day. And I'm telling you, if you start doing this, it will have a huge impact in your life and you will look at life differently. Here's the prayer. Two sentences. God, give me less of what doesn't matter. And God, give me more of what does matter. Think about that. Give me less of what doesn't matter, and give me more of what does matter. Church, what if we prayed this consistently? And not only prayed it, but really in our hearts we desired this. See, a lot of times I think we recite things, but it's not really in our hearts to recite it. But what if this was our prayer? Let me tell you something. It'd be very, very countercultural for sure. That's not the mindset of our world today. But I will tell you this. It would be very, very true to what Jesus teaches in the gospel. So let's look at the first part of this prayer. God, give me less of what doesn't matter. Now, please, Listen to the words of Jesus that we're going to read right now. This is so important. We've read this many, many times, but have we really listened? Have we really absorbed what Jesus is going to tell us here? This is so important, church. you got to catch this. In Mark chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves can break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Those are some strong words for us to grasp this morning. Listen, I said this to you last week. If you want to change your life, change your habits. And if you want to change your habits, let God change your heart. Because what Jesus is talking about here is a heart attitude. It's an attitude in your heart of where your desires lay. And for most of us, our desires lay in the things of the world. Just look at our lives and you can tell. But Jesus says here, in these verses, he says, don't store up, don't accumulate, don't hoard, don't do those things that are bringing you stuff here on an earthly basis. 
that we need to be heavenly minded in our desires and laying up our treasures in heaven where we're going to be at for eternity. Well, I'm not like that, Pastor. I'm laying up treasures in heaven. Are you? Am I? I had to really challenge myself this week on this. No, really what we spend our time doing is accumulating. We accumulate. We're consumers. i got to have a bigger bank balance because my bank balance isn't big enough yet. And so what happens is we put our security in money rather than God. I gotta go get that new outfit, man, or I gotta go get that new hat or those new shoes. I gotta get that new car. I gotta get this. I gotta get that. Why? Why are we like that? I, I really believe it's because deep down inside we're empty and we're looking for that external attention. Oh, man, you look fly, you know? Ooh, like the new ride you're in. And what it does is it, is it blocks us from dealing with the internal void we have in our lives. Remodeling my kitchen again. Fifth time in 20 years, I'm remodeling my kitchen, man. i got to get new granite tops or, man, uh, I've got to get rid of the granite and get quartz or whatever it is, you know. People are always trying to upgrade and get more, make it better. But church, I really believe God is telling us that we need to do a paradigm switch in our thinking. And to stop trying to get more of stuff. So, if you want less of what doesn't matter, then what, what, what do you do? What do I do? Well, the Hebrew writer tells us something in chapter 12, and I'm just taking a couple of thoughts from that. In verse 1, he says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Strip off every weight that slows us down. And in verse 2, he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The Hebrew writer says, strip everything off you don't need. Take off the stuff that's slowing you down. Take off the things that are interfering in your life. That's what we're supposed to do. Strip off the things that slow us and weigh us down. Because church, I'm telling you, we are slowed down with our stuff. We are consumed with our stuff. I mean, I know I am. I had to get checked on this this week pretty hard. And God's been working in my heart for over a year about this stuff. I mean, I know some of you who say you don't have anything to wear, yet you go into your closet and it's overflowing with clothes and shoes and everything else, man, and you've you got to have another closet to take care of. Like, you know, the other night we were watching uh, uh, House Hunters, right? And the biggest thing that every single couple wanted was a, a closet that was as big as anything else in your house. Why? I, I go to my closet. I'm very simple. I have... I don't have a lot of clothing. I know what I'm going to wear for the most part. I'm very simple. I pick it out, and that's it. I'm done. But they act like they're going to live in the closet. Well, we've got to have a bench over here, and we've got to have this over here, and they've got to have a window so I can look out my window. Of your closet? <laughs> it's crazy. People have so much in their closet. They're stuff full of stuff. And on top of that, you have so much stuff that your garage is packed from top to bottom. Can't even get your car in there. And so what do you do? You go get a storage unit. you got to store all this stuff. It reminds me of a Russian missionary who came to speak at a conference in America. And this missionary had traveled all over the world, and, and he had never been to America before. And he was fascinated, and he was asked to come and speak. And so as he's speaking, this Russian missionary said something interesting. He says, what stands out about America to me that's inconsistent with God's word is public storage. Think about that. He says, you have so much stuff that you need to have storage buildings for it. He says, it would seem that America is really about materialism. Someone who heard him say that at this conference piped up and said, you know what? 
We're like containers when we need to be conduits. And we are pails when we should be pipes. God has made every single one of us to be a pipe, not a pail, a conduit, not a container. Pipes and conduits get things where they need to go. Think about that. That's so profound. That's so profound. But that's our society today. You know what's so funny? As I never noticed this until I was putting this message together, I drive home on East Monta Vista every single day. And I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a, I won't say the place, there's a storage place that has on its sign and it says this, your garage called and said your car is missing it. Get a storage unit. <laughs> right? Like, honestly, how many of you can park your car in your garage if you wanted to? Right? One, two, three. Most people cannot park their car in their garage because it's so full of junk. It's so full of stuff. Right? It's true. It's the truth. I'm not trying to make hurt anybody's feelings, but it's the truth. It's where we are today in our society. Right? Listen, we need to stop saying we don't have enough, and we need, we need to realize that we really have too much. And we need to start throwing things out. And you need to throw things out as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. Because our stuff holds us back. It holds us back. We hang on to everything. And God doesn't want us holding on to nothing, man. He wants us holding on to him. <laughs> Those of you who know me, I have a rule. If I haven't used it in a year, really it's six months, but I'll kick it out to a year, I get rid of it. And that's the truth. Drives people crazy around here at the church, but man, we accumulate so much stuff, it's like, if we need it, we'll buy it again. Most of the stuff you all hanging on to now, it probably don't even work. Right? Like, have you seen that progressive commercial where the guy's going, he goes, he's got people and he's got a big dumpster, and, and, and it says, you know, when, you're, when you, you start acting like your parents or something like that. And so they've got, he's got people walking up, and they're throwing stuff out. This guy has car mats, and the guy goes, I bet you don't even have the car anymore, do you? He goes, no. Throws it out, right? Another guy comes up, and he's got all these owner manuals and stuff. He goes, I need to throw these owner manuals out. And he goes, do you have any of those things that you have owner manuals for? No. Throws them out. My point is, is that we hold on to stuff that we don't even have. And if we do have it, it doesn't work. Can you imagine trying to use a, a dial telephone today on the cellular network? It wouldn't work. Get rid of it, man. Stop holding on to stuff that does not matter. And that's in every area of your life, not just stuff. I'm talking you need to unload a lot of things in your lives. Some of you need to unload your schedule. Some of you got things in your schedule that don't matter. It doesn't matter, right? Oh, pastor, I can't make it to dinner and discussion tonight because I've got something else going on. And you're watching, you know, Dancing with Stars, <laughs> Right? I don't have much time, Pastor. Yeah. But, man, you, tell, you can tell me anything that's on social media. You can tell me whatever you're binging on Netflix. No, some of you need to start stripping out stuff of your schedule that doesn't matter, man. And that's the truth. Strip off every weight that slows you down. That's what we're supposed to do. So number one, the first part of the prayer is, God, give me less of what doesn't matter. And here's the greatest part of the prayer. God, give me more of what does matter. Who, who would want more of what does matter in your lives? And especially if God says this is it? All of us would, church. It's so awesome. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says this. Better one handful, handful with tranquility, in other, otherwise, in other words, peace, than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Think about what the writer's saying there. Better to have just one handful. I don't need two. Right? Because what happens is this. When we have both hands full, we're tied up. We can't do anything. Whatever's in our hands is it. 
No, in order for us to have less of what doesn't matter, we've got to let go of some things. And we need to make room for, what, for more of what does. So one handful is all you need. You don't need two. It's like my youngest granddaughter, she loves Jelly Belly. So anytime that I'm anywhere near the Nut Tree Plaza, two things. Carousel, Jelly Belly. Carousel, Jelly Belly. Carousel, Jelly Belly. Those are the only two, those are the only two things she knows. She go, okay, now let, me tell you, let me tell you this. She don't eat jelly beans. She might eat one or two. That's about it. But we got to go in and have to inspect every bag of jelly beans, and, 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 she's, and she's grabbing them by the hands full, you know? And, and Mama Bear be like, you don't eat jelly beans, honey. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And she's, she's all in, man. Two hands. I mean, she's, got, she's all in, man. It cracks me up. But man, one handful is all you need. And here's the thing. When you have only one hand tied up, you got another hand free to do something else. You got that free hand to go give somebody a hug who's hurt, man. To go help somebody who's in need. You got a free hand to encourage somebody. You got a free hand to praise God. You got a free hand to surrender. Better one handful with peace. Right? Which gives us room to have what matters. Than two handfuls that are chasing after the wind. What is the what is the writer saying there? Hey, can you chase the wind down, man? You can't chase down the wind. I don't care how hard you run after it, you cannot chase it down. And I really believe that that's the status of where we're at in our lives today, church, is that we're chasing after the wind. We're chasing after this, this American dream of more, 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 more. Like I remember my parents, well, yeah, one of the few things they ever told me that was worthwhile you know, you, you start with a starter home, and then in a few years, you, you sell it and you get a bigger home. And then you be, and it was always about getting that bigger home till, till you know, you're living in this big, huge house, right? And I'm thinking, well, why? If it's just me and my wife, because my kids are eventually going to leave, I hope. And so, I mean, why? So to have more of what matters most, you and I need to know what matters most. So define what matters most in your life. Define what matters most. How? I'm going to give you an example. Last year, I had some people show up at the church that I had not seen for 40 years. One of them was a... a, uh, well, there was, there were, they were two sisters, but one of them, was a, she was, her and I were very close growing up. Very close. We were just friends, never anything else. They visit our church last year. Come to find out she only had a few months to live. And when you realize you only have a few months to live, all of a sudden you recognize what matters. Her days were numbered. And I got news for you this morning, church. Your days are numbered as well. Life is ticking away. Every second, we're getting closer and closer and closer to blasting off of this earth. Right? Every day I wake up, I wonder, is this the last day, God? It's the truth. I really do. I wake up in the morning and go, man, Lord, thank you for this morning. What do you have for me today? Is this the last day? And see, if you recognize you only have a chance to live your life for today, because it's very short, you start to see clearly what really matters. And if you were told you only had a few months to live, and if I was to ask you in your life what really, really matters, the answers are going to be astounding. I think for some of you, you would say, ma'am, my relationship with God, my relationship with my spouse, my children, that's what really matters. 
Some of you may say, man, making a difference, man, making a difference. I'm going to go out blazing. I'm going to serve in my church. I'm going to show God's love to people that are hurting, man. I'm going to go out strong. Some of you would say, man, what really matters is my sobriety, the fact that God delivered me from this addiction that was in my life that I never thought I would ever be able to walk away from, but yet God came in. Others of you would say, man, knowing that my loved ones know Christ. Trust me, if you only had a few months to live, you would really start figuring out what really matters, and I guarantee you would not be on your list or anyone's list. That new leather couch, you ain't worried about that too much anymore. Definitely not worried about having that new Apple Watch. Well, I need that new Apple Watch when they put me in the grave. You're not going to worry about new countertops for your home. You're not going to worry about the 65-inch flat screen TV. You are not going to worry about any of those things because they don't matter. In the end, they're not going to matter. Why? Because the most meaningful things in life are not things. Think about that. The most meaningful things in life are not things. They're not. We think they are. We hold on to them like they are, but they're really not. As I was putting this together and I was thinking through some different things, one of the things is I always wanted to be a dad. I grew up without one. My parents were married, but they weren't married. My mother slept in the room downstairs. My father slept in the room upstairs. My dad was never home, never home. He kicked me out of my house when I was 14, almost 15 years old. Told me I had to go. I knew the pain of him not being in my life. And so being a dad meant something to me. So when I had children, I was like, I'm all in on this, man. Now, was I a good father all the time? Nope. (laughs) I wasn't. But here's the thing. I have four grown sons, four grown kids now. All are married and they have their own kids. And they're doing well. And and the things that I instilled in them, they will come to me today and say, Dad, man, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be this way. They have a work ethic like you've never seen before. And here's the thing. When I look back at my relationship with my sons, I remember the moments, not the things. That's what I remember. I remember playing rock band with the boys until 2 o'clock in the morning. Nate would be on the drums. Drew would be on the guitar. I'd be on the bass. And how many of you remember my granddaughter, Maddie? Right? Do you remember Maddie? (laughs) Yeah. Little Maddie. Well, she wasn't little when she was here. She was a teen. But little Maddie would be three years old, and she used to crack me up. She'd get on the microphone, and she'd get like a perfect score singing, right? And we'd be like, how's she doing that? Well, she, she wasn't really, she might know three words. But she knew how to fluctuate her voice. And she'd get this perfect score. But those are memories that I remember with them, you know? I remember playing basketball in my backyard with my sons, man. The house that I lived on on B Street, we had this huge courtyard. So I put up this nice basketball hoop. We'd be out there till midnight shooting hoops all night, man. Have the lights on the court, and we'd just shoot hoops and just have a blast. Going golfing with my sons and grandsons. Wow, right? Going to fairy tale land with my granddaughter. (laughs) I would have never thought in a million years you'd catch me at fairy tale land, but (laughs) we make that trip about six times a year, you know? That's like Disneyland of the North for her. I mean, geez. I think of the conversations that I've had with my kids. The conversations just, just the other day, Pat and I took out three of our grandkids and had lunch with them, and we were talking about life and their, their future and stuff like that. My son's marrying their incredible wives. Those are the things I remember, right? When I think about me and Mama Bear, I always wanted to have a, a wife and a strong marriage. Because my parents' marriage was a mess. It was a, it was a mess. I would never want a kid to grow up in that kind of dysfunction. And God sent me Mama Bear. And I don't remember the things we've purchased. I really don't. I mean, I think the one thing I really remember is her, is her ring. I remember that because that was an important moment. You know what I remember about her and I? The walks that we would take just holding hands. 
and enjoying being together. If any of you have been with me and mom and we go out and we start walking, the first thing she does, she takes that little bear paw and sticks it in my hand and we go walking away. We're always holding hands. No matter what, we go to pick up a Leia, walk across the street, boom, there she is holding my hand. Taking, taking drives up to Tahoe. We would get out of church and we'd jump in the car and go drive up to Tahoe. And just enjoy the beauty, the scenery. Put some music on, have a great time, get up to Tahoe, maybe have some lunch and drive right back. Going out to dinner, right? Our first date was Wendy's. I mean, you know, got to do it big. Um, Holding each other during the hard times, man. When we got the phone call that my father-in-law died. How broken my wife was. How broken I was. He was the dad I never had. Holding each other during those times. How she stuck with me when I was stupid, right? I tell you this all the time. The way she brings me coffee in the morning, because I know she loves me. That's what those are the, it, right? It's moments, man. I remember moments, not the stuff. As a pastor, yeah, I mean, thank you, Jesus. We have this building. This is great. We, we needed a place to be. But this, this isn't what I remember. What I remember as a pastor is seeing broken people and hurting people encountering Jesus because of the love you guys extend to them. Being forgiven when I'm dumb and forgiving others when they're dumb. Seeing the grace of God at work in our church That's what I remember. That's what I remember. Better is one handful with things that matter than two with things that don't. Give me less of what doesn't matter and more of what does because I have enough. I have enough. But some of you don't believe you do. Some of you don't believe you have enough this morning. And the reality is is that none of us should believe the statement that I just made to you that I have enough because it's incomplete. Because if you're just a regular person trying to get through and be happy, everything is going to tell you you actually need more. You always need more. That's the mantra. But the statement that I made, I have enough, is incomplete. And I want to help you fill it out so that you can say it and truly believe it. Because the correct statement is this, because I have Jesus, I have enough. Because I have Jesus, I have enough. Say it. Say it again. Yes. But here's the thing, you can only say it if you believe it and you truly have Jesus in your heart. Now, here's, here's, this is where it's going to get a little gritty for some of us in this room. Get mad at, don't get mad at me. Get mad at him. The problem is some of you, you say, I have Jesus, but you still don't have enough. You do have Jesus. You're saved. You've got him. But you say you don't have enough. Now, on a side note here, some of you are like legitimately struggling Like, forget the TV, Pastor. I'm not tripping on that. I'm not tripping that I don't have a 65-inch TV. I'm tripping on the fact I don't have a job. Okay? Or forget the Apple Watch. I got medical bills or whatever it is. I get it. Right? You need to work. You need to work in order to survive and either to meet your needs. Yes, I understand that. And I acknowledge that. And you're hurting and maybe you're confused and you're not sure what to do. But listen. Listen. You need to let God's word speak to you this morning. You need to listen. Paul wrote about having much, having little, and having nothing. And he said, I learned the secret on how to be content. Now, listen, there's not a single situation that any of you listening to me this morning, that this message right now and this truth does not apply to. Philippians 4.12. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. 
I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Paul said, I found a secret, man. I found it. And I want to share the secret with you. Now, some people take verse 13 and they, they really distort this verse. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Well, listen, Paul's talking about his living situation here. Like, I'm not going to run a 100-meter dash in 10 seconds. I don't care how hard I train. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. Paul's talking about his living conditions. And Paul says, no matter what my living condition is, I can live through it because I have Christ. If I'm well-fed, I have Jesus. If I'm hungry, I still have Jesus. If I have plenty, I have Jesus. And if I'm in want, I still have Jesus. And he says, because I have Jesus, I have enough. But sadly, some of you this morning, you have Jesus and you still want more. Well, here I'm going to hit you in the chest with this one, and you're not going to like it. I'm going to tell you why you're like that. This is why. Jesus is still in the background of your life. That's why. He's in the background of your life. See, when things are in the background, it's easy to miss. It's easy to ignore. Why? Because it's in the background. It's behind us. But listen, when, when something or someone is in the forefront of our lives, it's impossible to miss because they're right in front of us. And so the problem is this morning is that some of you, for Jesus, Jesus is background noise for you. He's background noise. He's in the background. You hear his voice. You sense his presence. But he hasn't moved here. He's still back here. And see, here's the thing. When you put Jesus in the forefront of your life, he's not some historical figure. He's not a Sunday school lesson. He's not a message that I heard at church today. No, what happens is when you put him at the forefront of your life, he becomes your closest friend. He's a friend that will stick closer to you than a brother. He becomes your counselor. When you're in times of need or confusion, he will counsel you. He will tell you what to do. He will be your confidant. You can tell him anything and he won't snitch. He won't snitch on you. He will be your comforter. And he will wrap his loving arms around you. And he will love you like no other person can. And see, when Jesus comes to the forefront of our lives, when he really becomes the predominant thing in our lives, then something starts to change. And we understand what Paul said. It doesn't matter what I have or don't have. I have Jesus, and that's all I need. That's it. And I'm going to share something with you. And you guys don't like it when I get personal, but I'm getting personal today. This is only the second time in my life, this period of my life, of my life that I'm in right now, that I can say, I can truly say, I have enough. I have enough. The first time was when I became a Christ follower. I could not believe that God loved me. I could not believe that God forgave me. I could not believe that this, this incredibly giant universal God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for my sins. And then not only that, that this, this incredible, huge creator being wanted to have a relationship with me, and he just wanted to love on me. And man, I didn't care about anything else in the world. I didn't. I said, just let me open the Bible and preach, man. And it cost my family dearly because I'm like, oh, no, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Well, you still got to work, right? And so I go and I, I, I get this, this incredible job, and, and, and here's what happened. Life started creeping back in. Started wanting to kind of had a lot of money. I wanted to start kind of living the good life and get nice things and accumulate more. And I had Jesus, church. I had Jesus. But let me tell you, I kind of put him a little bit to the side. In fact, I put him behind me. Because I still wanted more comfort. I wanted more money. I wanted more security. I wanted more recognition. I wanted whatever it was. Now, here's the crazy thing. is My wife never wanted anything like that. 
My wife is the simplest person in the world. She really is. She's never asked me for anything, ever. I'm so blessed. I don't have a wife who needed, who wanted the, everything that, that, that the world had to offer. She never wanted jewelry. She never wanted anything like that. She was so simple. In fact, if I had lived her lifestyle, her and I would have been a lot better off. And so let me tell you what happened. Over the course of this last year, something changed for me. So it wasn't the birthday I had this year. It was the one that I had last year. It messed me up. The reason it messed me up was this. I remember I was reflecting the night before this birthday I was going to have. I was reflecting on my life. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, I'm getting old. And here's what, here's what I realized that night that I had lived long enough that I had fewer days ahead of me than behind me. Now, that's a trip. And that's true for every single one of us in this room. Every second, we're getting closer to eternity. Every second, we're getting closer to death. That's the reality of it. And that night, I started to realize something. What I needed more than anything in my life was more of Jesus. Not more money. Not more status. Not more recognition. Not a bigger bank account. I needed more of him. And so I began calling on him and seeking on him. And realizing, and this is going to sting a little bit, because some of you are in the same position, that I've been chasing after the things of the world in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I had been chasing after the things of the world. And man, it's, it stopped me clean in my tracks. And I was like, man, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. And so I've been giving stuff away the last year. Cleaned out my closet, unloaded stuff in, the, in my garage, keeping only what I needed. Because the Lord said, your priorities are messed up, D. Get them right. And you're hanging on to things that don't mean anything. You need more of Jesus. Because as I close, let me just tell you this. If you got into a car accident today, and you got your body crushed and bashed up pretty bad, and you're laying in bed banged up in the hospital, you're not going to long for a pile of cash next to you. You're going to long for more of Jesus next to you. And when you're getting wheeled into the operating room, you're not praying for more followers to be with you. You're praying for more of Jesus to be with you. And when you send your kids out into the world like Mama Bear and I have, you don't just want name brand shoes on their feet because that's what it's all about today. You want Jesus in their heart. And when you're coming to the final days of your life, you're not going to care where you traveled the last year. You're going to care about where you're traveling to. And that's eternity with Jesus. And this is why Paul said he learned the secret of being content. He had Jesus, and he could do all things through Christ. So this morning, if you're sick and you need a healer, you need more of Jesus. This morning, if you're hurting and you need comfort, then you need the comforter, and that's more of Jesus. Today, if you're sad, feel lonely, and you need joy, well, joy is going to come from the Lord. You need more of Jesus. Maybe this morning you're in sin. Maybe you've never really had a relationship with Jesus. Well, this morning you need a Savior, and that means it's Jesus. You need more of Jesus. The need to simplify, it can only happen when we have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. That's the only way you're going to simplify. Because life is too valuable, church. Stop putting value on your stuff and start putting value on your life. 
on the things that are important in your life that you really need in your life. Our call's too great, but some of us can't reach our call because we're consumed by stuff. We have a good God, a gracious God, but we don't experience him because we have layers of stuff between us and God. And God doesn't want us to waste our life on things that don't last. He wants us to put everything that we have, our whole being, into our eternal existence. Because what you need to understand is if you have Jesus in your heart this morning, you have already stepped into eternity. That's your destiny. Because I have Jesus, church, I have enough. And I never want it any other way. Amen? Thank you, Father, for your word today. And the reminder, God, that we can let our stuff uh, become a problem. And so I pray, Lord, that we would learn to be content with what you give us, Lord. Father, as you showed me, it's, it's disgraceful to think that what you've given me isn't enough. As if you're a, a not a good God, that you're an uncaring God. Lord, you give me what I need every day. And so, Lord, help us all to have that mindset. Give us this day our daily bread. And Father, may we be thankful for what we have. You allow us to enjoy the fruits of our labor, God. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as that's not our focus. So Lord, may my brothers and sisters leave this place today with a new perspective, a new attitude of, with Jesus, I have enough. And Father, may we reflect that to a world that's hurting, that's lost, that if they just have Jesus, it'll be enough and their lives will be different. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all the church said? Amen. Deuces.